Feast TV is brought to you with support by Missouri Wines, Whole Foods Market, and Roth Distributing. I'm Kat Neville, publisher of Feast Magazine, and welcome to the October episode of Feast TV. This month, we are going to be exploring the richness of a Midwest autumn from beer to bourbon. We are going to be meeting some innovators across the entire region. And throughout the episode, I am going to be making a banh mi sandwich, which is a Vietnamese sandwich that layers pork and pickled elements on crusty baguette. The recipe is by Tori Bon with our menu options column and you can find the entire recipe online at feastmagazine.com. Now I'm going to be pairing these Vietnamese sandwiches with a Chardonnay which is by Baltimore Bend Vineyards and it's made out near the Kansas City area. And of course another great thing to be drinking on a crisp fall day is beer. And there are some folks down in the Shawnee National Forest in Ava, Illinois that are actually including foraged ingredients in their beer. Those are the folks behind Scratch Brewing, and let's go meet them now. I wish we had beers here. Somebody said last year that they saw a bear um, nearby, but I don't think they, I don't think they were accurate in their assessment. Mark and Ryan at uh, several different beer tasting events and we would always bring our homebrew there and uh, so they tasted mine and I tasted theirs and uh, Marika wanted to start a brewery and Ryan did as well so we all wrote down what our ideal brewery would be and uh, they all kind of lined up on paper so then we decided to take three years and figure out how to make it work so this is the end result. I, for some reason, was reading some reviews on our place not too long ago, and one of them mentioned uh, they thought that it was kind of similar to maybe an alternate universe where the hippies won, Ronald Reagan was never elected president, and there's free health care for everybody. When I first started home brewing, I was just starting to get really interested in um, kind of the locavore movement with food. And so naturally, I started using all the ingredients that I was finding from my local farmers um, and in my backyard in the beer that I was brewing. The very first uh, part of this brewery that we installed uh, were, were the hop trellises. I think we have maybe 15 or so in the ground out there as part of our trellis system. One of our missions in making beer is we want to make a beer that's you know pretty unique to this area. Just like our beer, um, we do a different soda every week. It's seasonal, just like everything else. Just last week, uh, Aaron went wandering through the woods and came back with five or six different leaves and bark and roots and all kinds of stuff. And we threw it into the soda and carbonated it, and I think it'll taste great with gin. <laughs> Why we decided to start doing wood-fired pizzas in the first place I'm not completely sure other than that they're awesome and uh, it's, you know, the traditional pizza that's kind of originally how they were cooked, you know. This is our, uh, our wood-fired oven. Aaron built this entire thing. Uh, please take note of that. Um, we do bread and pizza in here on the weekends. I built the oven over the, it took me a year to build it but the reason we chose to use a wood-fired oven is because 
it makes the best pizza and the best bread. So there was no, there was no alternative to that. So recently I've been gathering uh, pawpaws. And what makes them so unique is that they're a tropical fruit that grows in temperate regions. I think caramelizing the pawpaws would be good. Or How are we gonna do that? Cook them down. Like the other night whenever I made my, my snack. Oh, we should put the, we should put our maple syrup sugar. in it. We should caramelize it with our maple syrup. That would be good. So how are we? So okay. So we're gonna skin these. We're gonna pick out all of the meat. We just smash them. Out. Just, just the put them in the mash. colander. Put them in the colander and then uh, cut them into quarters. Put that in ice cream and then put the ice cream in all the right, beer. So we've made ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> the perfect beer for an ice cream float. Oh man. It's such a big and daunting process. Um, it's expensive, it takes so much time and effort um, that we figured we were better as a trio than any one of us were singularly. At a beer dinner a couple of months ago, I actually had their chanterelle saison. It was amazing. I'd never had a beer made with mushrooms before, and I didn't expect it to be as absolutely delicious as it was. So even though scratch is kind of hard to find, definitely seek it out because it's delicious stuff. Now I am going to get started on our sandwich. And as I mentioned, we're going to be doing a pork banh mi. Um, this is a very traditional Vietnamese sandwich that very often will incorporate things like pate. You can make a vegetarian with marinated tofu. You can play with it in whatever way you want, but we're going to be doing a pork tenderloin this time. And so I'm going to be marinating this. So I'm going to move this pork tenderloin off to the side. The first ingredient in the marinade is just a couple of garlic cloves chopped up. And now I'm going to be adding in two tablespoons of fish sauce. So now for our salt, we're going to add in a teaspoon soy sauce. One of the great things about Vietnamese food is that it has a real balance of salt and sweet and bitter and spicy. So each bite that you take is, is just interesting and fun. So here we have two tablespoons of black pepper and two teaspoons of sugar. And then we're going to incorporate a little bit of diced yellow onion. So I just added a quarter cup of grapeseed oil and grapeseed oil is perfect to use in this application because it has a neutral flavor profile. And the last ingredient in our sweet and spicy marinade is just a little bit of sesame oil. Now I'm just going to cut my pork tenderloin into relatively thin slices and put it into the marinade. Well, I have a pound and a half of pork tenderloin and I am just stirring to coat. You can either leave this at room temperature for an hour to marinate, or you can put it in the fridge for three to four hours to make sure that all that flavor is absorbed into your pork. So I'm gonna go ahead and set this pork aside, and when we come back from this next segment, I am going to be making all those pickled veggies that are on the top of those bun mi sandwiches. And so right now, let's head over to St. Louis and meet the Tilford brothers who are making masa from scratch. My brother Adam and I, own five restaurants in St. Louis, four of which are Mexican, and they're all culinary driven. So in an effort to make the food better than it was before, we decided to start making our own tortillas from a masa that we are making cooking corn from scratch. My business partner and brother Adam Tilford thought about this venture about two years ago and it kind of started as a joke we should cook our own corn and do it this whole process. We didn't fathom that we actually could take this on but after a few conversations we really decided that it's what we had to do to make our product better. The main difference between what we're producing now and, the, and what most restaurants in St. Louis do with making tortillas from a corn flour is they get a 50 pound bag of flour that um, is usually flown in from Mexico and basically the only thing they add to that is water. So it's any, it's any kind of instant tortilla mix, basically. What we're doing is taking whole kernel corn that we get from Farmersville, Illinois, and cooking it with food, food grade lime, and then doing a process called nixtamalization. 
whereas we remove the hole from the corn so we grind it. So the first step in the process of cooking the corn is the cooking it and we use this large cauldron or cooking vessel that holds up to 500 pounds of corn. So the way we know when the corn is cooked enough to uh, grind is the tips of the kernels here turn orange just brown as opposed to just white. that you get when we're cooking it and grinding it the smell that comes out of it is just unbelievable and the um, the texture we can control the elasticity we can control the color and the flavor all those things we control when we cook it through the, the four or five steps in the process it's a non-gmo product we're getting um, low carbon footprint is coming from an hour and a half out in Illinois, so we're keeping it local there. We're not flying stuff in from Mexico. Our goal ultimately is to not only provide our restaurants with the product, but also distribute it locally to some of the places on Cherokee Street and any other facility that wants to use fresh locally made masa. So here we are at our newest restaurant, Mission in Soulard. And this is where we are rolling out our tortillas for the tacos. Um, and then over here are our empanadas, which is another version of the masa. For the empanadas, we take this actual same tortilla, the masa we use for tortillas. We add a little salt and a little baking powder and actually a little vegetable shortening to make more of a dough that's suitable for baking. In this case, we actually fry it though. We actually experimented getting it from Chicago through our, our produce supplier. The product we use has no preservatives, so it, it, it wasn't lasting long enough, so we needed to make it every day. So now we do, we make it every day, grind it fresh daily in the morning, get it to the restaurants before lunch. Um, and again, there's only three ingredients, local corn, water, and food grade lime. No preservatives. So the Tilford brothers have a number of Mexican restaurants in St. Louis, and I can tell you when they switched over to that fresh masa, you could really tell the difference in just the texture and the flavor of those tortillas. It's delicious stuff. And so now speaking of delicious, we are going to go ahead and pickle some shallots and carrots to go on top of the bun mi sandwiches. So I'm just gonna julienne my carrots. And if you are not familiar with a julienne cut, it's essentially just a little matchstick. And now I'm just going to go ahead and cut these shallots into very simple rings. So I have in here one and a quarter cup, just uh, tap water. And now I'm going to add in a half of a cup of rice vinegar. And now half a cup of apple cider vinegar which this stuff is really good for you. Three tablespoons of sugar, one and a half tablespoons of just some kosher salt, and then I'm going to chop up another garlic clove, and we're also gonna add in some fresh ginger. I'm just gonna take this over to the stove and get it to a nice simmer just until the sugar dissolves and then I'm gonna bring it back over here and pour it on top of my veggies. Ideally, you'll want to leave this overnight, but for the magic of television, we're going to allow it just to sit while we finish up the rest of the dish. All right, so now, I am gonna go ahead and slice up all of my cucumbers and jalapenos and all the raw elements that are gonna be going on the sandwich as well. All right, now I'm just gonna break off a bunch of this beautiful cilantro. 
and the fresh basil. All of these different flavors, when they layer on top of each other, it's amazing. If you've never had a bun mi sandwich, you're gonna love it. Over in New Florence, Missouri, there's a gentleman named Gary Heingartner who is running the country's only wood fire distillery. He is using blue corn to make his whiskeys and bourbons, and let's go meet him now. I was a microbrewer. I like to drink, but I don't like headaches and I don't like hangovers. And when I learned how to separate those apart, I decided that that's what I wanted to do, distilling. You know, it's just right for the times. It was right for me and my life, and I just went for it. I'm always a biology major. <laughs> I did microbiology. You know, I got a degree in biology, and then I degree, got a degree in, in uh, agronomy. So the corn, wheat, and soybeans thing. And then I worked for a barrel company for several years. Uh, just everything in my life has led up to this point. When I was a kid, we used to cut white oak timber and make barrel staves, you know, so everything in my life is kind of built up to this point. We make most whiskey in this country out of yellow corn. And we raise yellow corn for cows and pigs. People do not eat yellow corn. That's not roasting ears, that's not sweet corn, that's field corn. So I decided if you're gonna make whiskey to drink, why don't we make it out of corn that we eat? So I've selected blue corn because the Hopi Indians and all down through Central and South America, they've eaten it for centuries and it's selected for taste, not yield. So we start with wood that's local. We've got a big pot still and we have wood fired. And then the wood, between the wood and the still is a big tank of oil. So we heat the oil and we pump the oil into the pot to cook with. So the coils are actually inside the pot and it takes a long time, it's a slow process. We don't have really rapid heating up or cooling down. It's real slow and gentle, and that gives us more time to separate the heads and tails. Yeah, the barrel is, is, is subjected to pressure. It's sealed, more or less. It's got a stopper in it. So when the pressure outside here changes, we have a change in barometric pressure. It doesn't change in here. So we have a drop in barometric pressure outside. There's pressure in the barrel, and it forces the whiskey into the wood, so to speak. Then we have the pressure changes and it pushes it back out. Of the, so that's what goes in and out of the wood, creates the aging process. We make a blue corn whiskey straight out of still, a white whiskey. It's an 80 proof, 100% blue corn. And then we take that blue corn and we age it into a barrel, a small barrel like we see here. And we use a toasted barrel for the corn whiskey. And then we make two different bourbons. We make a traditional bourbon, which is out of yellow corn and wheat in a brand new white oak barrel. And then we make a blue corn wheat bourbon and we age it in a chinka pin charred barrel. So as a small distiller, we're able to do some different things that the big guys can't because of our size. We go and start with the white whiskeys and take it to the more complicated bourbons. And the most single comment that we hear is, this is really smooth. It's exciting. I mean, <laughs> it has to be exciting. You know, they say, oh, this, this is really smooth, or this is great. You know, it's just like, wow.
So when I met Gary for the first time, I was completely inspired by just his creative spirit and just the way that he goes into everything 100% and his whiskeys are delicious. My favorite is the Rubenesque. So next time you're driving down 70, stop in and meet him in person. He's a great guy. So we are now going to be making the mayonnaise. And so you start off with just two egg yolks. So separate out your eggs. Then you might be wondering, why are you making mayonnaise yourself when you can just buy it in the jar? The flavor of homemade mayonnaise is just so far superior. And once you've made it yourself, then you realize it's not that difficult. So I've just split open a fresh lemon. We also want two and a half teaspoons of vinegar, half a teaspoon of salt, and then just half a teaspoon of Dijon mustard. We're just gonna whisk all of this up to combine. We've got half a cup of that grapeseed oil, again, neutral flavor, and I'm going to drop by drop add this into the egg yolk mixture, creating an emulsification. And so you have to stir constantly and just very, very, very slowly incorporate that oil. At this point in making mayonnaise for yourself, your arm will be a little bit tired, but it's well worth it. It is gorgeous and thick, and this is going to act as just like a foil to all of those spicy and raw ingredients that we're gonna have on that bunny sandwich. And now I'm gonna go ahead and cook the pork, which has been marinating for about the past hour. Now you don't ever wanna crowd a pan when you are cooking meat in this way, because if you crowd the pieces, it'll steam rather than sear. Okay, so this is just lightly browned on both sides. It'll cook really very quickly because obviously the pork is nice and thin. And next up, I want you to meet Ryan Brazil over at Novel Restaurant in Kansas City. When I named the restaurant Novel, the first thing I wanted to uh, be sure of was that people understood that we were using the, the term Novel as an adjective and not a noun. There's certainly contemporary restaurants and other people that are doing really good food. And it's not that we're reinventing cuisine or a style of cuisine, but I felt like my experience in New York, I had the opportunity to really bring something unique to Kansas City that wasn't available here before. So I take uh, ideas and familiar flavors and ingredients from the Midwest and kind of reinterpret them and, uh, you know, give them our novel twist. Whenever we conceptualize a new dish here, we always start with a food memory or familiar flavors and, you know, something that invokes a, a childhood memory, food that you ate, that your parents cooked for you, or a picnic or things that uh, bring out emotion. And we usually start with that basis and then we always strive to kind of change, do something a little bit different and utilize different techniques and uh, you know, maybe a slightly unfamiliar ingredient or something to elevate a dish beyond uh, you know, what it would be. Last week, the farmers came to me and said, we've got apples this week. You know, I think pork chops and applesauce and that's the basis of the dish. We smoke the apples with hickory wood. We use a lot of hickory wood because it's indigenous to the Midwest and Missouri. And one of the things that I really think uh, is unique about Kansas City barbecue. So we uh, peeled the apples, smoked those in hickory smoke. Then we took the apple peels and uh, charred those on the grill and then dried those out and emulsified them with a little red wine vinegar and mustard to make a charred apple puree. And then we had some pickled apples, uh, some pickled smoked raisins. Then it needs something vegetal. It needs something herbaceous. And then I said, this, you know, it needs a, a creamy textural element. We're always looking for balance. And there's more 
that goes into uh, the way your mouth and your nose and your brain perceive food than just the sweet, salty, sour, bitter. There's also spicy and funky and textural elements and temperature juxtapositions, and we try to incorporate that balance into all the dishes on the menu. The way the menu is laid out, it's more a, a list of flavors. The servers are very well versed in the menu and will walk the customers through it. Some of them can be daunted by the pig heads and duck necks and tripe and, um, I don't know, pork bellies. But once the, uh, if the, once the servers explain it to them and, and what the reasoning and the thought process behind it, and once they sit down and eat it, most of them are won over and really enjoy themselves, but it's a constantly evolving process and we watch customers and we accept feedback and we'll give it to the staff, you know, the kitchen will taste it, the front of the house will taste it, they'll offer feedback, we can tweak the, the balance, the acid, the salt, the sugar. We're never afraid to take chances, we're never afraid to make mistakes to put ourselves out there and when something doesn't work as much as I think it should work, how do we put our best foot forward? You know, we're always just thinking about how we can uh, redefine our position and how we can uh, improve. We never rest on our laurels. We're constantly, constantly pushing to, uh, to be the best and to do better than we did the day before. And now we've, uh, you know, we're up there, I think, with some of, the, uh, some of the best restaurants in the city. And it's more than just, you know, pleasing the customers. It's, you know, I think a good feeling. It's why we're in the hospitality business is to, uh, is to make people happy and, and do what we can to give them an enjoyable experience. So the first time that I had Ryan's food over at Novel, what I really loved was the unexpected Asian flavors that he incorporated. It's, it's really, it's so much fun to be able to taste food that is so individual and also still manages to celebrate the farmer and the producers. So. You know, definitely head over to Novel, it's amazing. So I am going to be finishing up my banh mi sandwiches. All of my different elements are finished up. This is just a standard baguette. Now, here's our gorgeous thick mayonnaise. We've got our pork. Now, some of those pickled carrots and shallots. Now, layering on our fresh basil, some cilantro, crisp, cool cucumbers, and those spicy, hot jalapenos. Yum. Our bun mi sandwich. This is going to be so delicious. I know that everybody in this room that you can't see right now is going to enjoy digging into this sandwich in just a little bit. have it. So this is an off-dry Chardonnay from Baltimore Bend, which is out near Kansas City. And I chose an off-dry wine to pair with this because the sweetness of the wine is going to play beautifully off of the sharp, you know, spiciness in the sandwich. So cheers to the flavor of fall, and I'll see you next month.